Welcome, welcome to the How Humans Work podcast. I am your host, Jeff Z, Jeffrey Salaji. So glad to have you here with us today. Season two is afoot and we are starting another journey into human nature. This time we're looking at the role passages play in the lives of my guests, the initiations, the transformations, the accidental, the intentful. Hold tight and listen in because we are about to journey into another incredible and beautiful series of conversations. Let's get into it. Here we go. Here we go. Albert Flynn de Silver, welcome to the How Humans Work podcast. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Total delight. Yeah, it is a total delight. I'm really glad you're here and I'm excited to talk with you for several reasons, particularly in the season two theme around passages. As a writer, as a poet, the passages that you've written in your lives, your words, which are descriptive, lyrical, and beautiful, which I love. Um, but before we get into that, I just want to check in and say, hey, what's going on here in the summer of 2021? <laughs> what is going on here? Well, a lot is going on always, primarily working on a new book project, that, well, several <laughs> Not several, two, two major book projects. One is on the back burner, a novel project, and um, but the latest is um, a book on consciousness and addiction. And um, I've given myself I publicly, I I opened my big mouth uh, to my community and and uh, said I was starting June first. I was uh, committing to writing 500 words a day for the next 90 days. Yeah, just to get real, you know, and to get going and just to, because I've been, I've actually submitted at least two that I can think of, possibly three book proposals to my publisher over the last couple of years, both of which have been rejected. <laughs> and so I've been trying to figure out like, okay, what's this next book? What's the real next book? Not the book that I think that I should write, but the actual book that's really resonant and that, that really feels authentic. And I think I'm there with this with this next project. It's um, really working around thought and consciousness and addiction, which is which is up in my life. Yeah, tell me more because I, I wasn't thinking about the subjects of consciousness and addiction, but <laughs> given the fact that I have read your memoir, Beamish Boy, which is a beautiful, lyrical, courageous memoir, I encourage the listeners to to read it, check it out. But, you know, how did you settle into this idea of consciousness and addiction? And what are your preliminary ideas that are starting to emerge in this book that you're talking about? Well, um, first of all, thank you for your kind words about the memoir. Uh, yeah. So my history is is one of growing up in an abusive and alcoholic family. So addiction has always been there. I've been sober from alcohol for it'll be 30 years this year, actually, in September. And, and so, you know, you, and it, it never kind of goes away. Like the addictive personality is not like, I think it's a human thing, addiction. You know, you, we think of ourselves as like alcoholics. We're sort of taught to think of yourself as like, you're an alcoholic, you're a problem. It's a, it's a label, you know, there's a, some sort of a, defection. Supposedly, most people can ingest a, a toxic substance and not get addicted to it. <laughs> I'm not convinced that it's a great thing, uh, that there's a normalcy that can be had with, with certain substances. Uh, that's kind of another topic. But um, I've, I've become, you know, also now in my, in my later life, I've also struggled with with issues around money and finances and spending and um, and so I've just been really interested in what is this thing about addiction and how is it woven into our consciousness and what's at the ultimate root? You know, can we be addicted to thinking, for example? So you got that label, that Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, kind of story. So are you starting to think about addiction in a deeper way or are there other layers in terms of how you think about your relationship with the notion of addiction now? Yes, absolutely. And I'm, I'm really interested in trying to get at the, the root. Like, why is it that we as humans crave 
to go outside of ourselves, to stray from our true nature. And in our true nature, from all, from what all the mystics tell me, <laughs> and all the the reading I've done in in various traditions, Islamic traditions, Buddhist traditions, Christian traditions, you know, they always come back to that that your true nature is goodness. That we live in a friendly universe. If that's true, why is it that we're always, you know, searching, searching outside of ourselves? Um, whether that's to religion or whether that's to food or whether that's to sex and pornography, whether that's to gambling, um, searching, searching, searching when it's already all here. And this has been my, in my spiritual journey, that's been my understanding truth as well. Like that's the truth that I've discovered it, from my direct experience in meditation and on the journey of recovery is that, yeah, that's, that's true. Like, that, that my true nature is happiness and joy and love and kindness. And that there ultimately is nothing else. There's nothing else to go searching for. Like it's all here. Like I have enough. I am enough. You know, and to, to try and really get to the bottom of that and to find some sort of a framework or structure that would support people in realizing that clearly. And, and, and as easily as possible. I think that's what's driving this book project. Yeah. Yeah. And how's it coming? How's the book project coming? Uh, great. I'm at, uh, let's see, day 36. Uh, Is that right? Yeah, day 35, 36, something like that. <laughs> and uh, I'm at like 20, I don't know, 25,000 words probably. So we're, we're cooking along and, um, you know, it's, this is really helpful actually, because I have not been articulating it out loud, uh, except, you know, it's been echoing in my head and I've been writing, doing a ton of writing, uh, but I haven't really been talking to that many people about it. So is there more you want to say while, while it's, while it's percolating? Um, ah, no, this is good. This is good. This is good. I Great. Mean, if well, you have other the, questions around it. No, I, I do. I, I do have questions and I want to circle back to addiction in a little bit, sure. but because you are a, a, a writing mentor, you do workshops, you bridge the world of spirituality and, and writing as a practice. You have an awesome book out called writing as a path to awakening that I also encourage people who are writers or who want to deepen their practice of writing to check out. It's a great manual. It's a, it's like a, a year long practice, right? It goes by month by month and got 12 different practices, ways for people to deepen in their relationship with their words. Yeah. That's right. Yes. A year to becoming an excellent writer and living the awakened life. It's the, <laughs> totally. the subtitle. So, <laughs> so it, it ties into this idea. And what I want to definitely give the listeners, because when there's someone with a particular body of knowledge and a practice, I'm like, oh, this is always such a good opportunity of skills development and teaching and go, OK, here, here, here's an expert. Here's a, a guide in the situation. So what are some of your you know, fundamentals, guidance that you give to people who are wanting to be writers or more generally creative creatives yeah no i mean even though it is called writing as a path to awakening it's really creativity as a path to awakening uh so it can you can kind of enter in uh wherever you are creatively whether you're a painter or a dancer or a musician or whatever um and i think we're all many things you know i don't like these rigid categories in especially in creativity um, I've been known to paint and draw and actually have an MFA in photography. <laughs> so I do a lot of creative things and have done a lot of creative things. And I appreciate uh, sculpture and the visual arts and dance and all of it. So I think the important thing at the beginning is to begin with the premise. And the premise is that we are creative beings. One of the things that I do on my retreats my live in-person retreats is, is we, we do a, a ritual um, where we gather, we stand up, we put our hands on our hearts, and we recite internally first that I am a creative genius, that I am a field of possibility. And we, we just sense into what that feels like to say that to ourselves. Does it feel weird? Does it feel awkward? Does it feel authentic? And we really just meditate into that. And then we say it out loud. We vocalize it through the body. And what does that feel like? 
So we sense into that. Does that feel authentic? Does that feel real? Um, or do we feel like we're just saying it because the teacher guy asked us to? <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> no, I'm so glad you're saying that because, you know, it's there's such a superficial, uh, if I just say the affirmation rather than the inquiry right. of where am I really at with this idea that I'm a, I'm, I'm naturally a happy being and yeah, I am a creative abundance of genius as well. I mean, that's, it's a great inquiry. Well, it's a loaded word, right? Genius totally is a loaded, loaded. word, you know? <laughs> Uh, but I truly, I know this in my heart of hearts. You know, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've worked with kids who are just learning to write, you know, first and second grade, all the way up through 85 year olds. And I've seen the most miraculous, beautiful, articulate, gorgeous language expressed over and over and over again. People who have no training whatsoever, no experience with writing. They're just coming to it straight out of the gate. And so, it's only our conditioning and our negative self-talk that keeps us from the page. And if people are into it uh, and they they find this gateway of expression that language is their, their way to go, um, then they should. My role is to remind them that, that this is their true nature. And, you know, I hate this. Well, I hear this from academics sometimes. Like, well, not everybody can write. Not everybody can be, you know, Jack Kerouac or... Emily Dickinson or whatever, you know, it's like, ah, I think maybe they can <laughs> if they're really into it and they really focus their attention and they give themselves to it. And the passion is there and the desire there and the intention is there and the commitment is there and the energy is there. So. No, I love that. And for people who are on the, I'm not so sure I'm a creative genius or I'm a writing genius, or I'm not sure there's an Emily Dickinson inside of me, but have, have negative self-talk, you know, sure. they're, they're there. So what are a few tips to, to bump people out of that state into the creative side? Well, so first is that actual meditative exercise, the resonating, the affirmations can be very, very powerful, you know, not the one off, like oh, I'm a creative genius. Yeah. And then you never do it again, or you never really sense into it. You don't give space around it. Um, you do have to come to it again and again, mindfulness practices, meditation, um, yogic practices, and just, you know, getting stuff down on the page consistently. And I have a, there's a series of, of exercises in the book. You know, one of my favorites um, exercises is is writing a, a letter to an emotion that's up for you in the moment, tuning into the body, always going into the body mm. and trying to write from from the body as much as possible, not so much from the head. Sensing into first that emotional state, what is the emotion that's up for you, and then writing a letter to that emotion, just like you were writing a, a letter to a friend, you know, like, you know, dear Mary, I miss you and blah, 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 you know, just like really being in conversation with them and, <laughs> and like taking it, letting your imagination run wild, you know, imagining that emotion as a, a friend, as a being, as an animal you know, with colors and shapes roaming through a particular ecosystem. That's one of the things I notice about your prose and your poetry is the incredible ability to let your imagination run wild. I found that in several passages in your memoir around like suddenly, you know, you let yourself leave the literal remembering and get into uh, beautiful descriptive journeys that just helped me as a reader understand you and, and and so how do you prime the imagination for writing and the freedom yeah that's such a good question because there you know two of my favorite books i um i, I uh when i was learning how to teach as a, a young poet in the schools uh there's this great organization in new york city called um the teachers and writers collaborative and they have a just a library of awesome books about teaching. And one of them is called Educating the Imagination. It just never really occurred to me like, oh, you've got to educate the imagination, right? Because we're in our culture, we're, we're trained away from the imagination. We're trained not to trust our imaginative capacities. And so what does that mean to, to educate the imagination, to train the imagination? Um, it starts with, with creating space for it, first of all trusting the wild mind uh, and going, uh, you know, short circuiting 
the the um, the conditioned mind, the the restrictive mind, the the shaming mind. Uh, you know, the mind that says you're not good enough or that's inappropriate or that's not right or you're doing it wrong. or You know, all those voices that come in and just intercept us when we sit down to write. Um, so free writing is a is a very common practice that we use. Yeah. Also, I imagine some zany prompts. Yes. I be, love... letting, the, letting the whimsical emerge. Exactly. Now, I like to get kind of goofy and wild and, and wacky. Uh, to bring in the unexpected and the surprising, because that's it's we have to, you know, the the framing and the conditioning is is just always at us, you know, it's always kind of holding us in and, and kind of keeping us almost caged, and so my my job as a, a writing teacher is to to remind you of your true wildness and to let that that inappropriate wild beast out onto the page, and to have fun with it. Yes, and a kind of courage. I noticed that about your writing also is the courage towards the truth as well. So kind of a beautiful blend of both the whimsical, imaginative, wild beast, and then a, a real sincere courage around impact experience. Well, I'm so glad that you use the word courage because that's a word that comes up over and over again in my, my teaching. Uh, because what happens with any art... Um, any expressive art, uh, but particularly with writing, because there is this such an intimacy with language that we have, is that the the shit comes up, you know, the emotions come up, um, trauma starts to unravel within us, and it takes a lot of courage to go deep, and to be expressive and to be vulnerable on the page, and so it's not for the faint of heart to face the page. Thank you for all that on the writing, by the way, and, and the skills around it. And I'll just re to review and just affirm, I really hear that the being present with oneself in terms of practices and breathing and mindfulness and, and giving oneself the natural space to emerge and making, you know, safe containers or, or places or opportunities that both include courage and, and zaniness and imagination. And I love that. And I do want to get into, because you know the show is about our deep human nature, and so you've witnessed from, you know, as you said, from young children, teens, all the way up to, you know, octogenarians, what are some of the passages you've seen people go through with their writing as a workshop leader, as a facilitator, as a guide? Um, and I just want to, I want to get your, your this is actually happening in my life. I get to see this. You yeah. know what I mean, yeah, yeah. as an acupuncturist, people come in, they talk to me. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. They just opened up that way to me. Yeah. And so I imagine you have a similar like marvel. And oh. so what are you marveling at about human nature it's through so the good. process of writing? It's so good. Like I love teaching. I have a signature retreat that I teach every year in uh, Shambhala mountain center in Northern Colorado. And it's it's really on these longer retreats. Some, it can happen. It can happen in an instant, but a lot of times because we have the spaciousness on a on a five day retreat, um, you know, people with the mindfulness and the meditation practice and the movement exercises that I do, people really start their nervous systems start to calm down. The imagination, their imaginative wild selves return, and they start to surprise themselves on the page. They start to witness their capacities. You know, they come into the retreat skeptical, you know, trying to make assessments and evaluations and judgments. Like, who is this guy? Is he going to be safe? Is he going to understand me? Is he going to support me? Is he going to believe in me? And, you know, within a couple of days, the opening, the expression, you know, I create a very it's really important for me to create a, a, an extremely trusting and safe environment for people because of that courage, because of the vulnerability that's inherent in expression. So seeing that level of, of uh, surprise and, and capacity in themselves and, and a sense of talent and beauty emerging from within themselves, that's the, that's what I'm on this planet for right there mm -hmm. is seeing that. That's just like the greatest joy. Super juicy. So, <laughs> Super juicy. juicy. so, <laughs> so, so I, I guess I, I'm, I'm imagining this retreat moment and I'm imagining somebody who doesn't maybe realize what's 
in them in some way, and then it comes out on the page. Yeah. What is it about the page? What is it that that does for people that say talking and therapy or what's it accessing if you have a sense of that? Well, it's, 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 it, basically it's making the, the unconscious conscious, right? It's, it's like we don't know what we're, we think until we write it down. And we don't know the, the beauty within us, the insights within us, the wisdom within us until we write it down or until we paint it forth and until we sing it out into the world. So it's bringing to life this um, whole internal uh, understanding of self that's so much greater than we ever thought. You know, we have this idea of our personality, like, oh, Albert, he's that writer guy. You know, he's the poet. He grew up in <laughs> Connecticut. And he da, da, da. You know, but then it's like, you know, I start going for it on the page and there's like all this other shit going th through me. It's, it's like, wait, who's that guy? Like, where did he come from? He doesn't know any of that stuff. And somehow I do know it. You know, we don't, it's hard for us to track all the knowledge and all the wisdom that we're accumulating day by day, moment by moment, just through reading, through watching a good film, through talking to a good friend, right? And and so then you get it out on the page and you're like, dang, you know, that's good stuff. <laughs> that's interesting stuff. That's, that's, that's layered humanity weaving through, showing up in an unexpected way. Keep going. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, yeah, I get it. I get it. And, and, and there's something about obviously the creative expression, but what I, what I was starting to tune into as you were speaking was almost like a dream is integrating and shows us in, in symbol things that we couldn't consciously conceive the emerging writing also can help us see what we've been organically digesting and integrating into our knowledge that we can't even pay attention to necessarily right. until we have that moment where we let it out. Yeah, exactly. And it's the mythic, beautiful. you know, it's getting the mythic out onto the page. We didn't even know we had the mythic within us and, and then it starts to come out as a story and it's a, yeah. So, yeah. So what do you mean by the mythic? What I mean by the mythic is the, the, the symbolic, the, the historic, the, the, the human symbols that have, that have um, emerged over millennia that are, that are within us, that, that kind of are these driving metaphors of our life and our purpose and our sense of belonging. And, um, and they emerge through, through story, you know, and through, um, through image. Um, and, and we can start to, to make sense of those and get clarity around those when we bring them to the page or when we bring them to the canvas, you know, or to the, to the dance space. Yes. And, and what I'm thinking is I, I'm goosebumped right now, but what I'm thinking about that is when you say the mythic, and this is what I'm feeling in the moment is that my little life, you know, narrative I have going on in my head suddenly is threaded to the historical and to the larger fabric. And that I'm actually a participant. <laughs> My life is a participant of these same energies, right? In the mythic. And it's like, Oh yeah, this, this is happening in my life too. I am a father and I am leaving a, you know, a set of kids behind for the next generation. I am a, a whatever it is, is the, the revelation or the, the integration. And, and that's so funny because I think a lot of, people and oftentimes myself, the narrative, the conversation in the head, right? The, the, the self identity, the self thought is so partial. And then all of a sudden when it reunites with those greater threads or those, those fresh rivers of knowledge that are like, Oh yes, I am part of the, the humanity going on here. There's something really helpful about that. That's what I'm getting out of it. Absolutely. And it's timeless. You know, we, we think we're sort of fixed in a particular time and that we can only reflect on a, um, a particular historic context that is now. But, you know, when you when you go deep into the mythic, then you've got all time at your disposal. There's a timeless aspect to, to great art and to, to great writing that's so beautiful to tap into. I want to go towards your life a little bit more. When we first met 
getting to know each other in Stepping Stones back in the, God, that must have been maybe 2006, I'm thinking. Yeah. So that's 15 years ago now. Yeah. Um, and I want to explore some passages that you've journeyed through. And maybe some are time bound, maybe some are more timeless. Mm-hmm. But when we met, you know, you were living in a converted school bus <laughs> <laughs> into right. a home. Yep. yep. And uh, in, in, I mean, talk about in the woods, like in the trees, you know, oh. and it was great to meet you and have the poetry come into the work we ended up doing with that group of boys back in those years. Um, but you've transformed so much, you know, you've transformed and come so many uh, in different iterations then. And also reading your memoir and, and looking at some of the the passages that you've been through as a young person. Yeah. One of the things that was so powerful about, about stepping stones and the, the rites of passage work that we got to do together was uh, because I never got to do that stuff really. I mean, I kind of did in some ways, but it was always woven into, um, I got this just alcoholic culture really, you know, I mean, I, I, if I think about it, I did go to when I was 12, my, I had a friend in Connecticut who had been for years going to this camp up in Maine in Penobscot Bay on a, a tiny a little island out there. And so this was 1981. And, there, it, and I didn't know anything about this camp. My parents didn't know anything about this camp. They didn't do any research. You know, they were just like, oh, cool, camp, go. <laughs> they sent me off. And uh, it was super primitive. You know, we lived in these A-frames. Um, we had cold water just running through a hose. But it wasn't primitive as in like primitive skills. <laughs> Developing no. your primitive skills like they do today. It was primitive as in we're not really caring that much or paying much attention to detail, if I understand right. Yeah. Well, kind of both because, you know, it was remote. It was not like I grew up in, in suburban Connecticut, you know, in this big fancy house with lots of stuff and um you know, lots of comforts. And um, so I wasn't used to like going to this camp where there weren't a lot of great facilities and it was the perfect thing for me. And it was the kind of the ultimate um, like wake up call, really. I mean, I was so out of my element and it was totally frightening. I only knew my one friend, Keith. And, um, but then we went through all the rites of passage. It was the first time I ever drank. You know, we went, they took us to a brewery. <laughs> what? You know, you were 12? At, like, at age 12, you know, we, we, we used to go to this quarry and we swam naked. You were also thrown into the cold water as a kind of overt so-called rite of passage. For yeah, that, that was that one camp, of the right? things that we had to do. They took us out in this boat into Penobscot Bay in, you know, in July. And the water up there in, in Penobscot Bay is extremely cold. You take off all your clothes, jump in there, and tread water. And so it was kind of trial by fire. And, um, you know, looking back on it now, it's like sort of horrific in some ways. Um, particularly, there was just interaction. We had one African-American kid who was in this camp, and he just got super bullied and picked on, including by myself. And I write about this in the book. There's a lot of shame around that and a lot of guilt and um, to, there's just so much to it in terms of rites of passage. I, I, so I should never discount it. Like I could write a whole book about that experience, really. <laughs> you know, you bring it as you ask this question, it's like, wait, that really was kind of a rites of passage. They weren't framing it well, <laughs> you know, they weren't framing it properly um, in terms of, of like, you know, helping us process things and, and, and be kind and focus on generosity and support and love and blah, blah, blah. But I mean, talk about awakening and change. And Did you feel like you became stronger or better or closer to what you said, you know, your more essential nature through that rites of passage? Do you think it was a different kind of initiation? I must have. I mean, it, part of it was wounding. There was beatings. Like we got beaten for not um, completing the run. We had to run every morning. And I remember this one, this one kid threw up. Um, I couldn't complete it. I was just like, I was too exhausted. I walked part of it. And I got my ass whacked. And I was like, who does that? <laughs> you know, being a kid for not running. You That's know? terrible. On some level, there was something about that discipline and that experience that in my memory 
was, I mean, it's both traumatic, but there's also, um, there's some aspect of it that was revelatory and was like, that kind of knocked me out of my, my conditioning on some level. I had to toughen up a little bit, you know, and to get real about the world um, and, and get a sense of like, well, this isn't safe. <laughs> you know, like, this isn't what I want to do. This isn't what I want to be around. And it was all woven in with adventure. So that was exciting. There was an element of excitement about it. Like, we never knew what the hell was going to happen day by day. Um, we ended up building a um, this, like, completely rickety of like wood, like plywood little camper on the back of a 1952 Ford pickup truck and drove to Nova Scotia. And they took us over <laughs> on this ferry and then we drove around Nova Scotia stopping at the, the brewery in Halifax, camping <laughs> on the beach. I mean, it was totally nuts. Like you would never send your, like Lawsuit Central, <laughs> you know. Oh my God. It's like so wrong, but yet so amazing that something still could work inside such a confused initiation. I mean, I have the most amazing memories of being in the back of that pickup truck and we would drive from the camp. We would go out to the quarry. Like we went out to the quarry all the time um, to go swimming. And I just have this image of us. They were all on the back of the pickup truck and, you know, hauling ass down this dirt road you know, our camp counselor gunning it through these puddles, cranking the little feet really loud on the radio and just splashing through these puddles. And we're just like, yeah, you know, just loving it. Just like time of our lives. And, you know, and then we'd be at this quarry swimming naked and women would show up. You know, these young women would show up. That was the first time I ever saw a naked woman. I was just like, what? (laughs) You know, so all of these things were just happening on that trip. And it's, it's, I mean, talk about that. That was like a major passage for sure. Yeah. It sounds like a potent cocktail of energies, yes. freedom and, 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 and sexuality and, and risk and punishment and opportunity. And, and it's like, wow, put, put some teens in the early teens in particular in there and woo. Yeah, it was it was totally wild, totally wild. Was that was that the start? Because I know in, from your memoir, like probably for the next ten years, you know, you had a very problematic relationship with alcohol. Oh, yeah. Was that basically the doorway into that period of your life? For sure. Yeah, and meeting my friend Keith, he lived around the corner from me, and he had all these older brothers and sisters, and he was the youngest. They had a place. Uh, like literally right around the corner from my house in Connecticut. And, um, and they had this thing called the derelict den. <laughs> and they all used to hang out and smoke pot there. They were all deadheads. And I mean, that was the first time I got turned on to Led Zeppelin and Jethro Tull and the Grateful Dead. And, and I never listened to any of that kind of music before. And, um, and the band, yes, I became totally obsessed with them. And, and the first time I ever smoked dope, and I was like, this is heaven. Like, this is like, you know, what a great way to numb out from all the weird shit that's going on in my household. And so I just loved it. And, um, you know, smoking cigarettes and cruising into town and cruising chicks and, <laughs> you know, hanging out at the Baskin Robbins. The whole bit was just, you know, and it, it be- became more and more destructive as I got into high school. Why do you think it took a destructive turn when it, when at first it was a, an outlet for the home condition? What turned destructive there? There was so much grief and trauma. I mean, we had been physically abused, myself and my sisters, uh, growing up uh, by our caretaker. We had a primary caretaker. My, my parents had hired a governess because they weren't really up for, for parenting. And so they hired this mean, nasty, Swiss German governess. And so we all got beaten in different ways. And the self-esteem was just in the toilet. You know, I just thought I was worthless. You know, I thought I had nothing to contribute to the world. I had nothing to give. I had no sense of my own creativity or agency or, or anything. Yeah. And my parents were riddled with guilt and shame around it. They, they couldn't figure out how to stop it. And, 
they, they it's just a total mess. You know, they, they their sense of consciousness and agency themselves was so wounded and hindered. That gets into the part of the passage I think you found your way to, and I don't think we're quite there in, in the conversation, is the forgiveness oh, yes. um, that you found for your parents. And I think that's an incredible kind of passage to go through. But I want to I want to stick more with the, the impact of, you know, violence on a child or, or mental, emotional, physical, whatever it is, that when when we are in that developing state and what mm. that does... And I'm kind of thinking in a way, now that we're here talking, and I'm thinking about the passage of self-medicating. Ah, yes. And, and, and basically thinking about your story and what I know about you as a journey of evolving better and better self-medications. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. and it starts with this kind of early... Well, let's party. Let's let's hang out. Let's yeah. let the energies loose, baby. Let's let, right. let's go somewhere. Let's do something. Let let's let's create some trouble, and then that defaults. That becomes problematic. That implodes. That's painful. I mean, there's really difficult, beautiful, courageous passages, which again, I encourage the reader to listen to in your or, or read in your memoir. But eventually, that turns into you know spirituality, or it turns into your relationship with the wilderness and nature. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So I, that's when I came into your life, and I want to move from the the alcoholic version of your self medication to those next passages that you found your way into. And I'm thinking about the space before you became this awesome workshop leader, writing facilitator, coach, mentor. In between that kind of sea pits world, that nature world, when we first came in and we're doing the mentoring work with the young people, what are some other things that helped you move further into healthier forms of self-medication? Yeah, well, I mean, I, to get there, we have to like, there's the waking up handcuffed to the hospital bed, <laughs> you know, under arrest and realizing that, that I wasn't going to get a, a, a second or a third chance because that was my second hospitalization. So long story there, but so you had a bad drinking night, several and near one death, of them near death experiences. Yeah. And you're in your early twenties, you're in college. Exactly. And you take it too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those, you know, survival moments were like, you know, okay. So this is the first passage, like, this stuff is going to kill me. And I quit drinking, you know, September 1st, 1991. But then I have to deal at some point with the reasons I drank, Mm -hmm. which I hadn't done. So, so I go, I moved to California, you know, I try and start anew. I, um, I meet, you know, friends at at the art Institute. I go to school at, at San Francisco art Institute. Uh, and I almost fail my year end review because I'm so lost. Oh my God. I was laughing so hard. I forget which project you did, but there was some project in your memoir. I was laughing out loud when you did some zany, zany creative well, project. The tin you foil know? ball. No, no, it wasn't the tin foil ball. It was like you were taking pictures of something or you were doing something in a room. I was throwing rocks at like the garbage can. And then, <laughs> and then it, it, it was, was a so pot top or something. And then there'd be an echoey sound and I'd run around the room, like drawing. On yes. The walls. <laughs> yes. That one, that one. <laughs> oh my God. Just, you know, meanwhile, my parents are spending $12,000 a year or whatever it was. That's a bargain right now. I know. Right. <laughs> but this was, this was the early nineties. Um, okay. So yeah. So, you know, I flail my way through. I finally get out of out of college. I find poetry. There's a whole yeah. story there. That's a passage in and of itself. I start teaching with kids. And, um, like, I didn't have any idea of anything to contribute, really. And by a, by a spur of luck, I, I had a friend who was teaching in the summer program out in Marin. They had just lost their their teacher, one of their summer program teachers. And, and she said, Hey, do you want to teach in a summer program? I said, what, teach what? And she's like, I don't know. You teach whatever you want. I was like, 
really? I'm sort of into this poetry thing. That'd be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about teaching, but so she's like, well, I don't know. Why don't you set up an interview with it? So I got this interview with a guy in the summer program at Marin Academy, I think it was. I didn't know what I was doing. And I just went to the library and I started getting books on how to teach writing. <laughs> and, uh, and then I ended up teaching this class in the summer program with these kids. And, and it was just awesome. They were so receptive and available. And even though I didn't really know what I was doing, we kind of muddled our way through and had fun. And then they had a, um, a backpacking program and they said, Hey, do you want to teach, do you want to take these kids up to, um, uh, you know, I have to point rays and do a little mini backpack. I said, sure. So I, I got my friend together and we ended up taking these kids backpacking. And that was like, that was my entree into kind of the nature world and, and turning kids onto nature and seeing language in nature and how to articulate their connections to, um, to a larger world, a larger universe of uh, animals and plants and earth energies. And as we all know, everything works in parallel, inward, outward. And so you're outwardly, you know, working and helping young people remember their value through poetry and language. But inwardly, what's happening for you? Yeah, so I guess inwardly what's happening for me is I'm, you know, I'm nurturing myself, right? I'm, I'm nourishing that, that child that never got held, that never got... Um, told about his inherent value that never got taught these relationships to nature. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's a beautiful insight. You know, I hadn't really thought that, that clearly about that, but yeah, there was, that was a parallel journey. That was around the time too. I got into meditation because I was living, let's see, in 93 or four, I, I moved out to, um, where I live now in Woodacre, California, and um, across from Spirit Rock, which I thought for my running joke is that I need to drive by. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm laughing right now because I'm suddenly thinking this is your new derelict den. That's right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> totally. It's totally my new derelict Except it's, den. it's not really necessarily derelicts, but it's a den. You know, it's, I mean, Spirit Rock is one of the American epicenters of American Buddhist practices and mindfulness practices. Well, so it's just, it's we, funny to think of it that way. Dry, it is really funny. And we used to drive by and I'd be like, why is there a mediation center out here in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> <laughs> my friend was like, no, Dude. dope. That's meditation. And I was like, what is meditation? What's that even? Yeah. And so one night they took me to see Jack Cornfield and I was like, oh, right. this is interesting. And what was he, his whole theme that night the very first night I, I sat with him was poetry. And I was like, oh, there's the echo. That's the echo. And I just knew that these were my parallel paths. Like this is, I'm in the right place. You know, this is the derelict den of awakening <laughs> that I should be, <laughs> that I'm supposed to be in. <laughs> I'm supposed to be frolicking. In. And then I, you know, from there, I just, you know, that was my big journey in, to yeah. practice. Which gave you the platform to basically reconcile with your, with your parents and forgive them for their limitations. Well, yeah, that was one point. And I should also mention around that time, um, the psychedelic therapy cult. <laughs> there was that piece, <laughs> that little piece of the pie. Right. Which, yeah. you know, it's not unlike your other initiations where there is a complex of both really amazing value and maybe things that aren't so on point. Yeah. Like a lot off kilter, <laughs> like <laughs> no boundaries, illegal drugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so in terms of the, the, the medication, the mm -hmm. self medicating part, what were the pros and cons of, of the psychedelic cult? Oh boy. Well, the, should we start with the cons? Let's, the cons were the, the lack of boundaries, you know, the, the betrayal, uh, the breach of trust. Um, those were the, those were the biggies, you know, but I gathered in your memoir that that particular betrayal clarified a certain value in you and you actually became stronger through that betrayal. Yeah, that absolutely. That's something I had to reconcile 
that this wasn't all bad. I mean, it's sort of the same thing with um, in writing about my the governess, you know, who I refer to as Grendel, uh, you know, this great monster who would be so easy to demonize because she's truly evil. And um, and yet I had to try and and drum up some sense of her humanity. You know, like, what was she doing there? Like, she was exiled from her country, from her family. What was her story? Um, could I find some humanity in her? So, and I had to ask myself that question too. Could I, what was the humanity in these, these teachers, these, these therapists, you know, PhDs, um, therapists holding people's psychic wellness in their hands and, you know, betraying a, a level of trust that's just, um, it's hard to fathom. And yet, at the same time, we were taking, we were taking on these journeys into this, like, depths of ourselves that, that's hard to replicate or to fathom. So there was a tremendous amount of healing. But it was really healing by fire. You know, healing by flooding, which is, a, I think that's even a technical term that you can over flood the system with, you know, traumatic releases or, or um, emotional, difficult emotional releases. So you overwhelm the defenses? Yeah. Um, and so really dangerous, dangerous stuff. And at the same time, here I am having to like hold two things to be true. You know, and I think this is part of a, a great awakening in any human sphere is to be able to finally get beyond the duality of all bad, all good, you know, to, to be in equanimity with, with things that are extremely painful and extremely damaging and difficult and to hold them in that same sphere with transformation and healing and reconciliation and love even. That's beautiful. I, I do want to know a certain part of your story that, that allowed you to get there because it was also an embodied thing and you had to release that. And you had that one moment with the governess wild vision when you were laying down, I think you were at spirit rock and yes. that seemed to be kind of the penultimate passage of your releasing the way the trauma had occupied your sense of self yes. unconsciously, consciously medicating, not medicating effectively, not effectively. So would you be willing to share that story? Yes. Yeah. So I was on retreat at Spirit Rock and um, with Ajahn Jamnian, who's uh, actually one of Jack Cornfield's teachers, a uh, Thai master, who had studied in many different traditions. The, the thing that really drew me to him that I didn't understand at first was that he'd done a lot of training in um, like Qigong and in chakra practices and in shamanic practices. I thought he was just like this Buddhist Vipassana guy which he was, but he had also done all this. <laughs> just, other... just a calm mind. He was just a, a really deep, calm, yeah. awake mind. But you could tell there was something different about him because he would, he would um, sort of shuffle into the, the, <laughs> to the center with just adornments of all of his stuff hanging off and under and woven into his robes, just trinkets and things that beeped and clanged and belled and whistled. And, uh, you know, he had like, bear claws and feathers. And I mean, it's definitely a shamanic being. And, um, you know, you go on retreat. Do you, do you, before you tell the story, <laughs> do you think that particular quality of him was part of what impacted you when you had this moment? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Even though he wasn't right there. No. It was like, he just had such a, a deep medicine vibration about him in the shamanic way that he... Somehow, yeah. Absolutely. Facilitated without, you know, facilitating, if you know what I mean. But one of the things about, like, you'll know this because you've been to Spirit Rock, but for those of you who are listening who haven't, it's a, it's a place of, there have been so many incredible teachers from around the world that have set foot and been present on that land. And so there's something about that land. You know, there's been a lot of human... Uh, releases and and um, grief letting go wings of <laughs> on that land that land is held a lot and um, 
it's open to a lot. You can you can just feel it when you get there, and the animals congregate in this space. Um, anyway, so so I was on retreat with him. He does a lot of like integrative um, bodily meditative experiences um, that I had never been aware of. You know, walking meditations, standing meditations. Um, we did some regular uh, qigong exercise. So a lot of stuff was getting released. And and it's intensive, you know, when you're on an eight-day retreat, it's just like, it's exhausting, just doing nothing, <laughs> you know, and being silent. Um, well, facing your own mind and your own nature. Facing your own mind, your own heart, yeah. yeah. Um, so there was one day where I just wandered off, and um, I sort of needed a break from the routine of sitting, walking, sitting, walking. And I just wandered up the creek bed and laid down in the creek. And... Um, and just sort of, and a dry creek bed. A dry creek bed. Yeah, there was no. Yeah, water. yeah, it's California. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dry to, creek bed. <laughs> yes, good to to acknowledge. Um, this is not recommended. Um, but anyways, there I was lying down in the rocks and in the earth, and just really just kind of tuning in and letting go into the earth. And just I practiced one of his his meditations of just tuning into my heart center, and and I just got so. Um, absorbed into the earth uh, that there became sort of no separation between myself and the earth. And, and, and at some point there was just this vision um, this clarity of vision. And I don't know how to really describe it other than kind of a waking dream in which my governess came to me. And, and um, it was one of these scenarios I had experienced as a child in which, you know, I'd be reprimanded for nothing you know, for just like wearing my baseball cap in the house and she would punch me and, um, or if I would mouth off and, and swear at her or whatever, and, um, I would get swatted or I'd get dragged down the hallway by my hair. And so in this vision, there's this, what appears to me was that, she, that I did something. I don't even remember what it was that I forgot to clean my room or something. And she grabbed my hair and was pulling me down the hallway. But, my hair just like came off in her hands like weeds, you know, like tufts of earth and grass. And she just threw it aside and she was so pissed. And then she grabbed me by the arm and then my arm like came flying off and she was so pissed. She was like, God, she threw it away. Like, you know, like a little mop handle or something. And then she grabs my other limb, my leg, and she rips that off and it just comes flying off and she can't get hold of me. You know, she keeps ripping my body apart. She keeps getting angrier and angrier and angrier. Until she finally is just so, like, she can't get to me. So she just, in her anger, she explodes into this just puff of purple smoke, you know, and and dissolves. And then at that moment, there was just this release, like physical release in my body. There I am. I'm in the creek bed. And there's just like whoosh, sort of this energy that just, like almost like a sort of an exorcism. I don't know how to describe yeah, it. Yeah, it's very Harry stuff. Potter, isn't it? It's yeah, Harry totally, Potter. <laughs> totally. And it just like left. I felt so light. Um, and I just felt like, I, oh my God, there was some sort of release that just happened. And I felt like I could just float up into the canopy, the trees. And I just started bawling my eyes out, just weeping, mm. weeping, just crying. But, but tears of relief, you know, tears of freedom. Uh, tears of just beauty and deep, deep understanding. Like, oh, <laughs> oh, this is what's going on. This is like how shit gets trapped in the body. Like, this is real. Like, I'm feeling this. I'm experiencing this in real time. This is no longer an idea in my mind. This is real stuff. And so that ever since then, it's, you know, that's informed my whole understanding of drama and my whole understanding of creativity and writing and like great art comes from the body. It comes from deep in the soul. You can't think your way to it. It has to be visceral. You know, I, I you think of, I think of some of the best artists in the world. Um, and, uh, Oh God, there's this guy, he's coming to mind. I don't know if I'm going to get his name, but, um, there's this great German artist, um, this painter that makes these just huge, um, giant, visceral, textural paintings that they're 
they're gargantuan and they're filled with with earth and glass and dirt and rocks and there's a vague dark images but and sometimes there's lead and um, so you feel the weight of the world you feel the weight of of the German psyche, you know, and you're looking at this painting. And if you're receptive to it, you're open to it, you, you're just kind of blown back in the gallery. The important point I want to make here is that, that we have to go deep into this visceral part of ourselves in order to, to access that, if, you know, if we want to have that, that impact in the world. It takes a lot of courage. It's terrifying. It's absolutely terrifying. So I don't want to sugarcoat or candy coat or make it seem like a cool new age experience. No, it's just terrifying, it's grieving, it's sad, but we are resilient. And what's on the other side of that is deep, deep love and, and deep, deep compassion and clarity and understanding and possibility. So that's, that's the gift of being willing to go deep like that. Thank you so much for joining us today. All music is performed by the incredible and effervescent Chase Jackson at chasejacksonmusic.com. Please support this podcast by following us on your favorite streaming platform, sharing it with your community and friends, and by making a modest donation to our Patreon page. To learn more about this show, our guests, as well as Jeffrey and his work helping people make peace with their human nature, go to howhumanswork.us.com.